Hi learners, I'm from Sound on Nerds, and this video is going to be on Unit 6, the GI track, where we will learn about anatomy, physiology, and ultrasound appearance. The digestive tract is also known as the alimentary tract, and it is one big tube that starts at the mouth and ends at the anus. It's about 8 meters in length, and the part that we consider to be specifically the gastrointestinal tract, or the GI tract, starts below the diaphragm. The GI tract anatomy that is relevant to ultrasound is going to include the esophagus, the stomach, small intestine, and the large intestine. Imaging of the GI tract tends to be a little difficult. Due to its air content, ultrasound energy is scattered and therefore unable to return meaningful echoes. Use of ultrasound to evaluate the GI tract is typically reserved for pediatric cases. However, if the conditions are good, adult application is feasible. Now we're going to continue our study of the anatomy, physiology, and ultrasound appearance of the GI tract as portions of it do appear in most of our abdominal images and we need to familiarize ourselves with the anatomy prior to studying pathology that is diagnosable by ultrasound. Let's get started with section 6.1 GI tract anatomy. We're going to focus on the four sections, the esophagus, stomach, small intestine, and large intestine, looking at location, key structures, microanatomy if it's relevant, and vasculature. The esophagus extends from the pharynx, travels inferiorly through the thoracic cavity, pierces through the diaphragm, into the abdominal cavity, and then empties into the stomach. The lower end acts as a sphincter and is the entrance to the stomach. We call the connection of the esophagus to the stomach the gastroesophageal junction. Generally, the sphincter is closed unless we're eating or vomiting, but in people who have acid reflux, the sphincter can relax, allowing stomach acid to travel up the esophagus. When we eat, the esophagus moves food down to the stomach by something called peristalsis. Now, peristalsis occurs all the way through the GI tract, and it is contraction of the muscles that surround the GI tract anatomy. So you'll see this kind of rhythmic contraction of the muscles. That contraction is going to move the contents a little bit further down the big tube. Now, peristalsis is actually very helpful for identifying bowel. If you see a solid structure or just kind of something in your image and you're like, well, I'm not real sure what that is. If you wait a little bit and then you see it start gurgling around, that's that peristalsis and that proves to you that you are looking at a piece of bowel. It's especially helpful when we are trying to find normal anatomy. Uh, ovaries quite often look a lot like bowel. If you start seeing an area you think is an ovary and it starts moving, probably not an ovary. Uh, same idea with pathology. If you see kind of something that looks like a solid structure in the abdomen, if you wait a little bit and it starts moving, again, it's probably bowel. But if it doesn't, we might be a little bit more concerned that it truly is a solid structure that we need to investigate. In these images here, we can see a few gifts of peristalsis occurring. In this top one here, you can see how the muscles are squeezing the content down into the stomach. So we do see the esophagus, peristalsis, the stomach, peristalsis kind of churns all that stuff around. We'll see bowel all the way through peristalsis. It is the mechanism by which the GI tract moves the contents through the system. In this example here, we have a fluoroscopy doing what we call a swallow study. The patient will typically take a sip of some sort of fluid or applesauce or something that has a radiopaque dye in it. Then they swallow it and we can watch how the food travels through their esophagus. This is mostly done to see if maybe the patient aspirates uh, where food goes into the lungs instead of down the tube that we expect it to. This is an endoscope image of the esophagus. You can see these kind of rings that go all the way down. This is the smooth muscle that's going to help the food travel down the esophagus. So after the esophagus, the stomach is going to next stop at the stomach. It's a very large, smooth, muscular organ, and it's responsible for secreting digestive juices and some other hormones that help break down the items that we ingest. Even though the stomach isn't very easily seen by ultrasound or evaluated well by ultrasound, it actually serves as a landmark for a lot of connection points for other structures that we see in the abdomen. In one of our earlier units, we did talk about the lesser curvature and the greater curvature of the stomach. The lesser curvature is on the liver side of the stomach. It tends to be just kind of a smaller piece, a smaller curve of the stomach. And the greater curvature is the outer part of the stomach, more towards the patient's left. This is going to be the longer, wider portion of the stomach. The stomach is supported by four main ligaments within the abdomen. On the lesser curvature side, it is connected back to the liver with the gastrohepatic ligament, which is also known as the lesser omentum. 
And on the greater curvature, we see the greater omentum, which is also known as the gastrocolic ligament, which connects the stomach to the transverse colon. Some other ligaments that we had mentioned earlier but have not taken a closer look at are the gastrophrenic ligament, where the fundus of the stomach is connected back to the diaphragm. And then we have the gastrosplenic ligament, where the upper body slash fundus portion of the stomach is connected back to the spleen. One of my favorite activities to do is to go to the Science Museum, and I was actually there very recently, and they had some interesting body parts on display. So I took a picture of this one because I knew I was doing this lecture. We have the esophagus coming in. This is the esophageal junction, and then it comes into the stomach. We've got the greater curvature over here and the lesser curvature on this side. The stomach then is going to empty into the duodenum. So let's look at the parts of the stomach a little bit closer. Now you've already heard me mention a few of these terms, but we have the fundus at the top of the stomach. The body of the stomach makes up most of the mass. And then the last part is the pylorus section of the stomach. Now the pylorus has a few other things in it. We have the antrum, which is the area right before the pyloric canal. Then we have the pyloric canal itself, which acts as a sphincter to allow food to pass from the stomach into the duodenum. If we take a closer look at the wall of the stomach, we will see that there is a very muscular layer to it. And in that muscular layer, there are three layers of muscles. We have longitudinal muscles, circular muscles, and oblique muscles. And it's these muscles that allow the stomach to peristals, which churn the food and help to start breaking it down, kind of sloshing it around through all the hydrochloric acid that is in the stomach. But the muscle layer is actually only one layer of the stomach. There are four layers that make up the stomach wall. So moving from the inside to outside of the stomach, we have the mucosa, the submucosa, the muscularis layer, which has those three layers of muscles, and then lastly, the serosa. In this image here, we can see that the stomach wall has been cut away so we can see inside the stomach. And you'll notice that it kind of has this like wrinkled, folded look to it. This is called rugae. And all of this is the folded portions of the mucosa and submucosa. As we eat, the stomach will expand and these kind of wrinkles will start to smooth out to accommodate food in the stomach. Taking a little bit closer look at the stomach wall then, we can see the serosa is the very outer layer of the stomach wall. Moving in, we get to the three layered muscularis. So we have those longitudinal muscles, circular muscles, and then the oblique muscles. Moving towards the lumen of the stomach then, we get to the submucosa. The submucosa is going to have lymph channels traveling through it, blood vessels, and then we get into the mucosa, and this is going to be the actual stomach lining. And along the stomach lining are all these tiny little cells that are going to be very specialized. Looking at those specialized cells then, we will see that there are cells called goblet cells. These are the cells responsible for making mucus. It's that mucus that really protects the stomach from basically digesting itself. So the goblet cells are the most plentiful, and you'll see them along a good portion of the stomach wall. We then also have parietal cells. The parietal cells are responsible for making those gastric acids. They are the ones that make hydrochloric acid. We also have chief cells. The chief cells are responsible for detecting proteins within the ingested food, and they are going to make pepsinogen. And when pepsinogen is present, it tells the pancreas to start making proteases because it knows that it, we're going to need to start breaking down some proteins. Another set of cells that we're going to see along the stomach lining are called G cells. These cells are responsible for releasing gastrin. You might remember we had G cells in the pancreas as well. They are the same type of cell. They both release gastrin. But in the stomach, they recognize that food has entered and they tell the stomach to increase its acid secretion. So G cells tell the parietal cells they got to start making some hydrochloric acid. The D cells then, or delta cells, again, are also found in the pancreas, and they both make somatostatin. The D cells are responsible for kind of for monitoring how full the stomach is, and when we get to the point where we don't need the hydrochloric acid anymore, the D cells are going to activate, telling the parietal cells to slow down the production of the acid. Remember, in the pancreas, G cells were gamma cells. 
They are in the stomach as well. And D cells are delta cells. As far as this microanatomy goes, I mostly just wanted to point it out to you that the stomach and gastrointestinal tract still play a role in the exocrine and endocrine process of digestion. And it just kind of points out how their roles kind of overlap in the production of those hormones and enzymes. Moving to the small intestine anatomy, the small intestine is a long coiled tube, and this one is about five meters long and only four centimeters in diameter. The small intestine we learned in one of our earlier units is attached to the posterior abdominal wall by something called the mesentery. And if you remember, the mesentery were folds of peritoneum that kind of house the small intestine and anchor it back to the abdominal wall. So this is another exhibit at the Science Museum. And of course, I had to grab a picture of this as well. We can see the liver here. This is the stomach. This is a greater omentum here connecting to the transverse colon. But for this slide, why I included it in here is this is our mesentery. These are little small bowel loops, and they're all supported by this mesentery, the folds of the peritoneum that kind of hang on to and house some important things for the small bowel. Now we can't see the mesentery on an average patient. Sometimes we are able to see it if there's a lot of fluid. You'll see these kind of bands of tissue that connect back to the abdominal wall. There are three segments to the small intestines. The first segment is the duodenum. That is the area that is going to get food from the stomach first. After it passes through the duodenum, it's going to enter into the jejunum. And after the jejunum, it goes into the ileum. The ileum then is connected to the cecum and the cecum is the start of the large intestine. For the sake of clarity, I do pronounce this first part of the small intestine as duodenum, but you may also hear it pronounced as duodenum. Both are correct and refer to this first section of the small intestine. So speaking of the duodenum, there are some special parts to it. When food comes out of the pylorus, it is going to be metered into the first part of the duodenum. The duodenum has four sections to it. We have the superior section. It's going to curve around into the descending section. As it travels more medially again, we're going through the transverse section, and then we get a little curve up into the ascending section, and from here it's going to go into the jejunum. For ultrasound, the duodenum actually holds quite a bit of significance. It really surrounds a lot of anatomy that we see kind of in the midline here, and it's home to the ampulla vater, where we see those bile and pancreatic enzymes entering into the duodenum. Recognizing where the duodenum lies in regards to a lot of our anatomy that we're interested in is important. And that's because when air gets into the duodenum, it can start to obscure these structures. So it's helpful if we know what's being obscured and how to combat that. So the first part of the duodenum, after it comes out of the stomach, is going to sit right above the common bile duct. So if you have air in this area, there's a good chance you're not going to see that common bile duct very well unless you can angle around it or roll the patient. We then see that the second part of the duodenum curves around and the gallbladder sits like right here. And sometimes again, when air or food material is in the duodenum, it can mimic gallstones. So we wanna make sure that we are separating duodenal echoes from true gallbladder echoes and determining are those echoes coming from the gallbladder or are they coming from the duodenum? Again, another great spot to just kind of hang out and wait, see if you see any peristalsis through this area to confirm bowel versus gallbladder. We consider this first, second, and third section the C loop, and you can kind of see why it looks like a C. So this is the C loop of the duodenum, and it kind of cradles the pancreas head within it. So again, if there is air within here, there's a good chance we're not going to see the pancreas head very clearly. Lastly, then, as that transverse section comes across and the ascending portion goes up. This is all in front of the aorta and IVC. So if we again have a patient with air in their duodenum, there's a chance we're not going to see that proximal and mid portion of the IVC or aorta very clearly. So to get around this, we want to make sure that we are either angling around the gas bubbles that are in there, possibly giving the patient some water to kind of push water through here and push the air out, or we can try rolling the patient or just kind of push a little bit harder, trying to move that air manually out of the way. Very similar to the stomach, the small intestine also has layers to its wall, except we are adding in a fifth layer. So starting from the outside, we have the serosa. Again, that's the outer layer of the wall. 
coming into the muscularis layer, then the submucosa layer, and then the mucosa layer. Now where the fifth layer comes in is what we kind of consider the superficial mucosa layer or the lumen. And when the bowel is flat against itself, we will see kind of an interface of where the superficial mucosa layer kind of connects to one another, and it's going to create a distinct line through the center of the intestine. So we do consider that our fifth layer when we are talking about the five layer gut sign. This little cutaway here shows that we have some rough patches to the inner lumen of the small intestine. These are called villi and the villi end up increasing the surface area of the intestine. So it improves how well we are able to absorb nutrients from the food that has been broken down and digested. Moving on to large intestine anatomy, the large intestine is going to pick up from the small intestine at the junction of the ileum and the cecum. The large intestine contains six sections. They are the cecum, which is home to the appendix. We then have the ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon, and the rectum, which is home to the anus. Some other key features of the large intestinal anatomy we have the cecum, and this is where the large bowel starts. The ileum is going to kind of come in here and connect to the side at the ileocecal junction. The cecum is going to give rise to the ascending colon, and when it churns, literally, into the transverse colon, this is called the hepatic flexure. This is where the ascending colon twists and comes across the abdomen. So the hepatic flexure is named so because it's right by the liver. Transverse colon goes across the top of the abdomen, just below the stomach, and is going to turn again at the splenic flexure. So the left side has the splenic flexure again because it's right next to the spleen. Turning inferiorly then, we have the descending colon. There's going to be a slight turn into the sigmoid colon, and that is going to turn again into the rectum, and the rectum then is controlled by the anus and a sphincter there to control the release of feces. The walls of the large intestine still have five layers, but they're going to lack the villi portion of the mucosa. They're not involved as much in absorption of nutrients. They're going to be more involved in the absorption of water. They have a little bit of a segmented saccular appearance, and these sacs are called the haustra. If we were just referring to one sac, it'd be a house drum. As far as ultrasound is concerned, one of the more significant parts of the large intestine is going to be the appendix. Now, the appendix is found right by the ileocecal junction. It's in the right lower quadrant of the abdomen, and it represents a remnant of the apex of the cecum. So here you can see the ileum joining to the cecum, and just inferior to this joining is where we expect to see the appendix. Sometimes it's referred to as the vermiform appendix. Vermiform basically means worm-like, and so it explains the visual appearance of the appendix. The general location of the appendix is about two-thirds of the way to the right anterior spine of the iliac crest, and that is if we were to draw a line from the umbilicus or the belly button to the iliac crest. So from the belly button or umbilicus, we would draw a line out to the hip bone. We're looking at the anterior spine of the hip bone, and about two-thirds of the way out, we are going to get to a point called McBurney's point. And this is the standard location for where the ileum and the cecum join up, therefore representing most likely where the appendix is originating from. So again, we have our ileum joining up with the cecum, and we expect the appendix to be just inferior to this area. This is where it originates. However, after that, it has kind of a mind of its own. Most appendices are going to travel inferior and a little bit more medial into that pelvic or about the five o'clock position. As this diagram demonstrates though, there are actually quite a few different positions which the appendix can take. It can go sub-cecal, which means that it goes below and more off to the side of the cecum. We can have retro where it travels back underneath the cecum. Post-ileal, it takes a turn underneath the ileum. Or we can have pre-ileal, where it lies over the top of the ileum. Again, most commonly though, we will see it in this pelvic five o'clock position, kind of lying over the psoas muscle towards the iliac artery and vein. 
Now, an adult see appendix is actually really difficult to see, but with the safety of ultrasound, we can always attempt a look. Our biggest limiting factors to being able to see the appendix by ultrasound is going to be patient body habitus. So on thinner patients, we have a better chance of seeing the appendix, how much gas is in the area, which can vary from person to person, and exactly where that appendix has traveled to. Again, a retrocecal or a post ileal position is going to be harder to see than that pelvic position. So in adults, the appendix is typically pretty difficult to see, but we can always try. Sometimes we'll even see it incidentally if we're doing a transvaginal ultrasound. That tip of the appendix can travel near the right ovary and we might catch a little glimpse of it over there. However, it is very, very common to take a look for an appendix for pediatric examinations. Typically they're much smaller bodies. We can see to the appendiceal area very well and we save them from a little bit of radiation from a CT. To round out the anatomy, we're going to talk briefly about the GI tract vasculature in section 6.2. There are a ton of blood vessels that are responsible for bringing blood into the GI tract. Now, not all of these are going to be significant by ultrasound, but as a person who works with anatomy, it is important that we understand what blood vessels bring blood in and how these organs drain their blood. Looking at the esophagus, which is slightly cut off in this image here, we do have some esophageal branches of the left gastric artery. We also have some up higher ones that come from like the subclavian and other parts of the aorta. Specifically concerning about the esophagus is when we have issues with the liver accepting blood. Sometimes that blood can kind of back up through the system. And then what we'll see are esophageal varices. These varices are basically dilated blood vessels that surround the esophagus. And should they rupture, a patient would start to bleed into their esophagus they'd start vomiting blood, and it can actually be very life-threatening very quickly. So esophageal varices can be seen arising from the liver, traveling towards that esophageal junction that we can see by ultrasound. The stomach then has some major branches. It has one major branch off the celiac trunk called the left gastric artery. Another major branch is the right gastric artery, and that's going to arise from the hepatic artery. And then we'll also have some major branches that arise from the splenic artery. The small intestine is mostly going to receive its blood via the superior mesenteric artery. So that is a direct branch off the aorta. Once it branches, it's going to have kind of this webbing pattern to it as it goes to feed both the small and large intestine. And then we'll also see the inferior mesenteric artery giving rise to kind of that branching webbing pattern again to head off to the colon. As you can see from this image, there are a ton of blood vessels, and this is just part of them and not even all of these are seen or appreciated by ultrasound. We have major branches that come off the aorta. Those major branches are going to give rise to secondary branches, and kind of after those secondary branches, it's kind of the end of where ultrasound can see anything. We can't see the left gastric artery. We can't see the right gastric artery, but we can see the hepatic artery. We can see the splenic artery. And when we understand how the blood is traveling through this area and where it's going, we can perform Doppler studies on some of these more major branches and then be able to analyze those Doppler waveforms that we get to understand what's going on further, to understand if there's some sort of problem in the bowel, is there an aneurysm or a blockage somewhere along the splenic artery, it can tell us quite a bit. So very outside of the purview of this lecture, but that is why we want to know where this blood is headed as it leaves those major and secondary branches. As far as blood coming back from the intestines, most of this is all going to be drained by the inferior and superior mesenteric vein. Recall that the inferior and superior mesenteric vein are going to join up with the splenic vein to form the portal vein. From there, the portal vein heads off to the liver. So all those nutrients and toxins, everything that the intestines absorb is going to be brought back into the bloodstream and dumped into the portal vein to bring back to the liver. And then the liver is responsible for filtering that blood, metabolizing what it can, storing what it needs to, and transforming other toxins for excretion. We've already talked extensively about the physiology of digestion when we discussed the gallbladder and the pancreas. However, the GI tract actually has a pretty big role in it too, not so surprisingly. But the role that the GI tract has in the physiology of digestion and how it works is a little less important to ultrasound than the pancreas and the gallbladder are. However, we're going to still discuss it just to kind of round out our discussion about it. So we left off in the pancreas lecture 
talking about the fact that we have gotten down to enzymes breaking down the macronutrients in the duodenum. But before we pick that up, we're going to talk a little bit more again about how the food gets into the stomach. So remember, we eat our food, and in the mouth we chew it up and add saliva to it, and that saliva has some amylase, and then the amylase is going to start breaking down those carbohydrates. We swallow, and the food is going to move down the esophagus and into the stomach. Now remember, the stomach has those specialized cells that are lining it. We have the gastrin cells that are going to recognize there's food there and tell the parietal cells to start making hydrochloric acid. We've got the parietal cells making that hydrochloric acid to kind of help start breaking down the big chunks of food that we just ate. The chief cells are recognizing what's in there, getting some hormones sent out to the pancreas to start making some proteases. And then we've got the gallet cells that are making mucus to help protect the stomach while all of this acidic breakdown is starting to happen. The muscles of the stomach are going to start contracting and mashing and pushing on all of that food, mixing it up with the hydrochloric acid, and that's going to make a substance called chyme. Chyme then is going to move towards the pylorus. Remember, that's the muscle at the end of the stomach. And the pylorus is going to open, let a little bit of chyme through, and that's going to shut and wait a little bit. Open again, let a little bit of chyme through, and it's going to keep doing that to slowly empty the stomach of the chyme. Once the stomach is relatively empty, those D cells will activate, recognize that the stomach is relatively empty, and again, tell those parietal cells, hey, we can stop making hydrochloric acid. We're on to the next section. So the acidic chyme now is in the duodenum. Bile is coming in from the gallbladder. We've got enzymes coming in from the pancreas, and those are going to really start to break down those still relatively big nutrients that are in the chyme. So we're proteases to break down our proteins, amylase to break down the carbohydrates, and lipases to break down the emulsified fats from the bile. In the small intestines, then, is where chemical digestion occurs, and it's going to just keep further breaking it down, breaking it down, breaking it down. As those nutrients pass by the villi, they are now small enough to be absorbed through the villi and into the bloodstream. Remember, those vessels are going to carry all those nutrients, anything that we ingested, through the bloodstream into the portal system, and that's going to return back to the liver for metabolism, storage, and excretion. Whatever the small intestines can't break down is going to continue then through the large intestine. In the large intestine, there is going to be salt reabsorbed and water reabsorbed. And by the end, we are left with a relatively solid piece of feces. So waste is removed from the body then via the anus in the form of poop. Now, there aren't really any laboratory tests that are going to be helpful to the sonographer regarding GI tract function. However, there are some stool presentations that we can use to kind of clue us in to some of the issues. Now, we normally expect feces to be brown, and that brown color is going to come from the bile that is left within the fecal matter. When we have dark, kind of black, tarry stools, that is indicative of an upper GI bleed. It ends up being black because if it's an upper GI bleed, we're bleeding up like towards the esophagus and the stomach up towards that area. That blood is going to travel all the way through the system and by the time it gets to the large intestine to be expelled, it has kind of clotted off, it's lost all of its hemoglobin, it's kind of just this black old yucky blood. And that is why we see upper GI bleeds present with dark tarry stools. Opposite of that then, if we have bright red blood in the stool, then we know that there's going to be some sort of lower GI bleed. Blood hasn't been hanging around long enough to coagulate or lose any of its structure, and so it still is very much in its original form. Very common to see it with like hemorrhoids. Uh, diverticulitis can also cause it as well. Another very common thing that you'll see in notes is that the, the patient mentions pale stool. So they might call it white or clay colored, and that is typically going to be gallbladder disease. Remember, we normally expect it to be brown. In the setting of gallbladder disease, if bile can't get into the duodenum, then that color is no longer there. And so we'll see a much paler form of fecal matter. And while not very specific to the GI tract, doctors can run what we call a complete blood count. That's where they're going to look how many red blood cells, how many white blood cells, and how many platelets are circulating in the body. We will see that if we have a low amount of red blood cells, that could mean some sort of internal bleeding, so that could lead to our upper GI bleed or lower GI bleed, or we might see that the patient has an increased amount of white blood cells 
And if that is accompanied by pain in the abdomen or fever, then we might start to suspect some sort of infection along the GI tract. Let's go ahead and take a look at how these structures look by ultrasound in section 6.4, ultrasound appearance. Now the esophagus can be seen in the neck and it's typically seen posterior to the thyroid. So we've got an example of the thyroid gland here. That's all this kind of hyperechoic area. And the esophagus is this target shaped area just posterior to it. This is the trachea off to the side here. So the trachea runs very medial in the neck. Esophagus is slightly displaced to the left. Uh, we've got the carotid artery here and then some muscles in the neck as well. So target area in the neck, that's the esophagus running posterior to the thyroid. The esophagus then is going to travel down through the thoracic cavity. We're not good at seeing that because of the lung tissue there. It's going to pierce through the diaphragm and right below the diaphragm, we should be able to see the esophageal junction. So here is our diaphragm. This is the aorta and the left lobe of the liver. You again will see a slight target shaped area. It's usually kind of hypoechoic with a hyperechoic central portion. This is the esophageal junction right before it empties into the stomach. It is not uncommon for inexperienced sonographers when looking for the pylorus. Remember that's the muscle at the end of the stomach. They might mistake the esophageal junction as the pylorus. But next time you're scanning the aorta, take a look, see if you can see that esophageal junction kind of sandwiched between the left lobe of the liver and the aorta. The stomach takes on a lot of appearances based on what the patient has eaten or has not eaten, or if there's a tumor in there, or if they've drank something. So there's just really no normal stomach appearance per se, but we can talk about some of these appearances. So in this example here, this is a relatively collapsed stomach. We can almost see that fifth gut layer sign because we're seeing the collapse, the mucous membranes being all the way connecting to each other. But then we have the mucosal layer, the submucosal layer, the muscle layer, and then right on the outside here, we have the serosa. So this is relatively collapsed down on itself, kind of making that star pattern. We can see the rugae within the collapsed stomach. In this example here, uh, this looks like maybe some sort of kind of mass within the stomach, but there's also some fluid in it as well. The reason we know it's the stomach, it's in that left upper quadrant. This is the left lobe of the liver and transverse. So we'll see it just to the side of it. In this example, we are seeing some through transmission because of the fluid in the stomach. In this example here, the stomach is very distended. It's got a lot of fluid in it. It's got a lot of little particles within it too. If we were scanning this live, it's not uncommon to kind of see all this stuff kind of swirling and sparkling around in this area. And here we have an example of a slightly distended stomach. Again, we can kind of see those layers to the wall and a little bit of fluid within it. At the end of the stomach then is the pylorus. So this is the stomach over here. We're moving into the antrum of the stomach. So remember the antrum is part of that pyloric section. And then we get into the pyloric muscle and sphincter here. So this darker part is the muscle. We can see the pyloric canal going through here and this muscle is going to open a little bit and we'll see food content going through and into the duodenum. So this muscle is going to be the controller of how the chyme exits the stomach and enters the duodenum. On pediatric patients, it's very common that we are looking at the pyloric muscle to see if it's thickened to the point where it won't let the canal open and then it causes a big backup in the stomach and then those patients end up kind of projectile vomiting everywhere. The normal pylorus is going to be three centimeters in length. So the canal should be less than three centimeters and the muscle should be less than 1.4 centimeters or 14 millimeters. This image is from a newborn. This is how you're going to see the pylorus well. It is definitely not well seen on patients that are adults or even early adolescents to older children, but we can see it very well on infants. The pylorus then empties into the duodenum. Remember the duodenum kind of wraps over the common bile duct, medially to the gallbladder, down and around the pancreas head, and then connects to the jejunum. We've got a little video here, and if we look just medial to the gallbladder, 
we're going to see this kind of shadowed area right along here. This is gas in the duodenum. This, this is all duodenum through here. So you can see why it's really important that we isolate the duodenum from the gallbladder so we don't mistake any air and shadowing from the duodenum as gallstones within the gallbladder lumen. If there's a lot of gas in this area, remember to kind of push down through that area, see if you can kind of get it to move along, or just really wait and see if the peristalsis will bring it out of the area. Looking a little closer at the layers of the intestinal tract by ultrasound, we can see them. If conditions are good, we can see them actually fairly well. Looking at the top one here, we have some fluid within the intestinal tract. So what we are seeing is that kind of superficial portion of the mucosal layer. So that looks a little bit more echogenic. And then we have the deeper part of the mucosal layer, and that is going to be hypochoic. Then we go to the submucosal area that again is hyperechoic. The muscularis is hypoechoic, and then the serosa is hyperechoic again. So it's kind of neat that we go bright, dark, bright, dark, bright. And if you look at our labels here, we have S, M, S, M, S. So if you can remember that the muscularis and the mucosal layers are dark, that'll help you to identify those two. And then you're just looking for the bright lines around it to identify the other three. This is a cross section of the intestinal tract. Again, we have the lumen with a little bit of fluid in it. So we are seeing the superficial mucosal layer, the mucosal layer, submucosal, muscularis, and then lastly, the serosa that surrounds it. Now, both of these examples do have a little bit of fluid within the lumen of the intestine, so it's easier to see all five layers. It's more common to see that these are collapsed on one another, and then for oftentimes the submucosal echogenic layer is going to kind of blend in with the chyme or the feces, whatever, in the intestines at that moment. We talked about peristalsine is an event that occurs all the way through the GI tract. It's the mechanism by which it moves content through and the peristalsine is very, very helpful for identifying bowel. So in this little clip here, we can see kind of the swirling, gurgling area. There's actually another little bit down here. This is peristalsis. So had we just stopped here when this wasn't moving, we might think, well, that might be a mass right there. But if you wait long enough, you'll most likely see it move along because of that peristalsis. So it's very helpful in identifying solid structures for what they are, or confirming that it is indeed bowel that you're looking at. Here's another example of some peristalsis. Now this is not normal appearance, I wanna point that out, but I liked this picture because we can really see the contents moving and we can see the villi within the small intestine. So this patient actually happens to have a small bowel obstruction, which is causing all the content to kind of back up, dilate the intestines and fill it with fluid. So we can see that internal part of the small intestine very well. But again, this is not normal to be able to see the villi this well. Uh, sometimes we'll see this again with small bowel obstruction. Uh, sometimes people have some sort of like norovirus. And so with diarrhea, they just have a lot of extra fluid in their intestinal system. So it's not necessarily an uncommon appearance, but it is definitely not a healthy, normal appearance either. Here we're taking a look at the transverse colon. This shows nicely the haustra. So the house jar are kind of these little lumps that make the colon look like it has little sections or segments to it, and they kind of take on a little bit more of a saccular appearance. The house jar kind of gives the colon a little bit more of a cloud-like appearance. Here we have a normal appendix. The normal appendix can be a little bit difficult to find, but again, we want to take a good look through the right lower quadrant, and we're going to typically see it near the psoas muscle and the right iliac vein and artery. We want to prove that the appendix has a blind end. That blind end proves that it is not just a loop of small intestine, that we are indeed seeing the appendix. And then we also want to follow it back all the way to the cecum and show where the cecum is and the ilium connecting. Appendix exams definitely get much easier the more that you do them. It's just a matter of seeing enough numbers to be comfortable identifying the structures in the right lower quadrant. Once you identify the appendix, if it is normal, it will measure less than six millimeters. 
If you push on it, it should collapse. So we call that compressible. There should not be any pain in the area. And we aren't going to see any fluid or echogenic fat surrounding the appendix. So again, this is a very normal appendix. We can actually see the five layer gut sign on this appendix as well. We have the, we have the superficial mucosal layer, mucosal, submucosal, muscularis, and then the serosa. So we have that kind of target appearance and the alternating layers. It's also not uncommon for us to be scanning through the pelvis and notice kind of a large area posterior to the bladder or posterior to the uterus in our female patients. This is typically representing the rectum with feces in it. So you'll see kind of a large circular area. It has a very bright echogenic rim and then kind of some shadowing behind it. So this is usually the rectum. If it looks incredibly abnormal to you, absolutely take pictures of it. I think some newer sonographers tend to see this and think it's a solid mass within the pelvis versus thinking about where it's connecting and what it's connecting to and that it is most likely the rectum with stool in it. To finish up this lecture, then we're going to briefly touch on protocol in section 6.5. Now protocol for the GI tract is going to be very targeted. For example, in pediatrics, they can order an abdomen ultrasound to look for just appendicitis, which is inflammation of the appendix, or they'll order an ultrasound just to look for pyloric stenosis. That's the uh, thickening of the pyloric muscle. Or they can order an ultrasound just to look for intussusception. And intussusception is when the bowel kind of telescopes onto itself, all pediatric pathologies. In adults, we might look for hernias. Uh, we can look for the appendix. We might be able to look for diverticulitis. But in adults, the CT scan is going to be more often the choice for bowel-related differentials. But because it is so targeted to a diagnosis, the protocols for the bowel are very specific, and we'll cover them more when we talk about those pathologies. But in general, if you are looking through the bowel, you want to be very slow with your movements. You want to use very calculated movements. As you can see in the top picture here, they are kind of demonstrating go down, across, up, across, down, across, up, across. You want to be very methodical in the way that you evaluate the bowel. You want to look in different planes because the bowel is very twisty and loopy. You want to make sure that you're evaluating it in all planes. You're definitely going to want to start with an age appropriate and patient size appropriate transducer. In our pediatric patients, we quite often start with a high frequency linear transducer, might drop down to a little bit lower frequency linear transducer for older, uh, thicker patients. And then for adults, if we can't see with either of the linear, higher frequency transducers, you can switch to a low curve linear transducer, but you're not going to get nearly as much detail and it might start to degrade the quality of the image that we are getting. So always use the highest frequency possible and typically start with a linear transducer. When we are not performing bowel specific protocols, you'll notice that the bowel is in most of your abdominal pictures and most likely causing some artifact, which is going to obscure other organs. You want to make sure that you are trying to roll your patient, try different breathing techniques, see if you can kind of angle around those bowel bubbles, possibly try again when the patient has been NPO, or try something called graded compression. Now graded compression is helpful anytime you're looking through the bowel. We most commonly use it when we are looking at the appendix, but basically what you're doing is slowly pushing more and more pressure onto the area, and that's going to squeeze the bowel out of the way kind of push any air out of the way as well, and it gets you closer to the area that you want to see. And that brings us to the end of our Unit 6 lecture. Ultrasound definitely has a place in evaluating the GI tract. However, it is not always the easiest exam for ultrasound to be used for. Make sure you are going through your activities in your workbook. There are some labeling activities in there, and then you have your nerd check questions that are great for making flashcards with, so you can evaluate your recall of the information presented.